Good morning. I'm on a three hour time difference. I expect you all to be nice. They made me get up at 3 a.m. That's not a good thing. It is a distinct honor to be with you. As a member of a team speaking about the most essential elements of our lives, quality, design, responsibility, joy, happiness. There we go. Now, when I remember first reading this quote, I thought Al must have been in a very bad mood that day. Um, and I call him Al only because I think it's fun. But when you look into this quote, you realize just how sobering it is. Professor Einstein was writing to a dear friend. He was begging him to stop designing munitions. Specifically, gas. Gas designed to kill. And with deliberateness, I chose this today because of recent events in the world and weaponized gas and people who choose to abuse science and technology. Professor Einstein begged his friend in a series of letters and particularly with this plaintive plea, technological change is like an ax in the hands of a pathological criminal. His friend developed the gas and used it not for the Allies, but the other side in World War I and World War II. Professor Einstein said in his final days, he felt it was his worst failure by design. I've always loved his face. It's such a beautiful face. It's at one moment silly. Remember how he always used to stick out his tongue and he had such fun. But it's also a face of sincerity, a face of passion, a face of intelligence, a face of humanity. In the room today, we have people of all abilities. And so you'll find as I try to deliver my message to you that I'm going to do my best to describe everything that some of us see, others of us can only hear, and some of us will have interpreted. Everything that can be invented has been invented. The commissioner of the US Patent Office supposedly said this in 1899. I'm here to remind us it is not true. In fact, it's very much not true. This poor man never said it. This is what he looks like. This is why he looks constipated. <laughs> he's not happy, clearly he's not happy. Can you imagine having this hung around your neck for the entirety of your career? As best we can tell, this was actually based on a joke that was occurring in Washington, D.C. at the time, and something that evidently started in the mail room by some silly little intern who thought it was funny, and a reporter picked it up and attributed it to the commissioner. Poor Chuck. So we have fake news. It's been around a long time. It started wars. It's finished wars. It's created marriages and I'm sure a few divorces. Fake news is dangerous stuff. But what is it? We've seen evidence of it. You think you're having a bad day? <laughs> Imagine moments such as this having to testify, as Mr. Zuckerberg did, to somehow explain, we let the horsey out of the barn before we even thought about what we were doing with this new technology. And I'm happy to share that my mommy was right in calling it the Facebook. 
mother got her wings in January, and she used to give the whole family sort of a, a tick when she would say, have you been on the Facebook yet today? And someone would always say, Mommy, it's Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Stop calling it the Facebook. Well, she was right. It was founded as the Facebook, and I'm going to call it that from now on in honor of my mother. <laughs> So when you hear people mumbling behind my back and saying, you know, I thought Patty Moore was supposed to be smart, she keeps calling it the Facebook. All of a sudden, I get reports that I was imitating a reporter who was handicapped, and I would never do that. Donald Trump, 29th of July, 2016. I have the image of the Politica fact, truth a meter it's on pants on fire level. And while I hope you understand I'm not trying to be obliquely political at all today, I am just trying to get us all on the same page in terms of the sensibility of what we do going forward. It's this, oops, that was me dropping my mic, sorry. I do this just to irritate the poor gentleman backstage because I'm wearing an outfit with no pockets and there's, it's really hard to mic me. It's kind of fun. Okay, so here, let me explain. I'm 65 now and I'm somewhere between the Dowager on Downton Abbey and Judge Judy <laughs> in terms of personality. I share that as a warning. And as I say to students all over the world, try not to irritate me because mama's not in a good mood. <laughs> when I witnessed this news conference of uh, then candidate Trump mocking someone with a neurological condition, I was thunderstruck and horrified. As you already know, my entire career has been about equity by design, compensation by design, for the snowflakes that all of us are, no two of us alike, but we all have some level of capacity. And design and technology, I believe, is meant to meet that level of capacity, to compensate, to embrace, to make better. And so I am horrified when I see the vulgarity of disparity, when I see prejudice, and when I see bias, and when I see vulgar cruelty of one person bullying another on the basis of what they can or cannot do. I was blessed with two sets of parents. I was raised with my grandparents in our home, and I know that has defined my personality. I was far more concerned about what grandma had to say than my mother. My mother was easy. She thought I was adorable. I was her firstborn. But grandma was a tough act. There was getting nothing by her. You flew straight or you were in trouble. I adore this woman. She's 50 in the picture I'm showing you. And I need everyone to recognize that, yes, in one generation's time, the definition by a numeric visual has changed dramatically. My grandmother also died at my age, 65, which I, I find so sad because, for example, today in medical science, Prince Philip just had a hip replacement at 93. So we keep pushing the envelope, and the importance of technology by design in our lives is the great helpmate in all of these advances. But as you can probably tell, I really adored my grandmother because she allowed us to play with her powder and paint. I don't think there was a day I didn't have lipstick on when my grandmother was in charge, and we just thought that was delightful. But there did come a special day when I was walking, of course, to church with my grandmother, and she encountered one of her girlies, and they had their hug, hug, kiss, kiss, mwah, mwah, had a little chat, waved goodbye. As we separated, my grandmother looked down at me and said, you don't normally see that shade of lipstick during the day. <laughs> and then I found out what mean girls were. <laughs> and that was more than 60 years ago. History repeats itself. 
I adored this woman. She was a tough Irish broad. She came over on the boat at the age of 17 with my grandfather. Two years later, my father was born and my grandfather died. And she made bathtub gin and took in laundry in Hell's Kitchen in, in New York City. And she was a tough cookie. And she survived and she thrived by design. At 17, when I was preparing to go to university, I began playing with chemicals. Um, this picture is actually um, one that my, my uh, daddy loved very much. Um, you can see it's wrinkled. It was in his pocket. Um, I found it in his wallet when we were preparing him uh, for his final goodbye. And I was so pleased he carried that. It was right next to my baby picture and a lock of my hair. Uh, he liked me as a blonde. Most people didn't, and so I said goodbye to Clairol. And I went to the Rochester Institute of Technology. I actually wanted to be an artist, but I was very pragmatic even at that tender age and realized there would be bills to pay. And so I thought I would do medical illustration as my major, but then that year they stopped the major and I had to rethink my life plan. So from fine art, I went to applied art in the field of industrial design. I was the first woman to graduate in industrial design from the Rochester Institute of Technology. And as one of those firsts, I soon learned what the Mad Men era was all about. At the age of 17, I was first sexually assaulted in an interview. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know why it was. I wasn't sure what to do. I froze. Without getting into too much detail, the professor who was interviewing me, looking at my portfolio, put his hand up my skirt. I never told anyone about it until this year. I feel now it's actually important and should be part of our conversation. The last time I was sexually assaulted was at the University of Cincinnati in October of last year. I had just turned 65, and I was pinned to a wall in the B&B where I was staying and maliciously manhandled by a colleague who was very drunk. I froze again, and I'm very disappointed in myself. You might have noticed I came out on stage today with a cane in hand. I should have beaten him to a bloody pulp, and I missed the opportunity because like it or not, I'm a pacifist. I've thought about it since, so I'm a flawed pacifist. <laughs> and it's probably also why I will burn in hell, because I do have bad thoughts. <laughs> but that said, certainly violence is never the answer. And so I'm sharing it with you today because I want us all to be reminded, always and ever, that we have to be mindful for everyone's safety and security and in our work especially, we have to continue to look for the means by which not we put ourselves in a plastic bubble, but where we make a world that is truly a world of equity by design. In university in, in the 70s, applied reading, I'll call it, became very important to me. I met this lovely gentleman who left us very recently through a very special book. Elvin Toffler wrote Future Shock. And if you haven't read it recently, please revisit it. And if you've never read it, you want this as your playbook. Elvin gave us insights. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. How true. How can you even begin to argue with that? Future Shock, my well-worn copy. It comes in various colors. So if you don't like red, you can get blue. I got hit by a blue car, so I don't like blue. And this happy face, another gentleman of his time. 
And interestingly, someone who never graduated from university but was able to teach as a professor. I don't know if we'd even be allowed to do that today. He wrote, design must be an innovative, highly creative, cross-disciplinary tool responsive to every person's needs. It must be more research-oriented. This is where, in the 70s, designers fell in a faint. Research? Research? What? 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 Science? What? What? But he was adamant. His name, Victor Papanak. We must stop defiling the earth with poorly designed objects and structures. And he wrote the tremendous design for the real world. And if you haven't read this, time to call Amazon. I decided to digress a bit. Before there was Sesame Street, before there was the neighborhood man, I guess Tom Hanks is going to do him in a movie soon, which I can't wait to see. That could be very special. There was Captain Kangaroo. I am a Captain kid. I adored Captain Kangaroo. He was one of the first television babysitters. Yes, my mother utilized his services. I was glued to the little tiny screen in our front room in Buffalo, New York. And I loved Captain, not just because of his cast of characters, um, Bunny Rabbit and Grandfather Clock were my favorites, but because he read us a story. Every week he picked a book. And as I was pulling together the writings that have helped form my opinions today, I realized this might be the most important business book ever written, Stone Soup. Better than Who Moved My Cheese and Freakonomics and all the rest of the top sellers. Let's really shake up Amazon sales and start buying Stone Soup. Make them wonder what's going on. Stone Soup can be found all throughout Europe in every country in its own version. It's a, a true cultural tipping point. Everyone loved this theme, this story so much they told it in their own language. And very quickly, it's about three unknown people who enter a village somewhere. And the villagers are frightened, concerned, not too happy. They're soldiers. People are hiding in their homes, and they're not very friendly. They don't really come out. But the soldiers start putting wood under the cauldron in the town square, and they pour in the water, and they start placing stones in the water, and they start smelling the vapors and smiling and chatting happily, and one villager comes out, and the next, and the next, and the next. And they ask, what are you doing? And they say, we're making stone soup. What stone soup? I never heard of it. It's the best soup in the world. Would it help if you had a carrot? Oh, carrot might make it better, certainly, yes. And someone, well, I have some potatoes. Maybe, would potatoes make it better? Oh, possibly, possibly. Turn up. So as you can see, out come the friends, the neighbors, the food, the veggies. Suddenly, we have a true soup, stone soup. Not a wall, a bridge. My first boyfriend was my grandfather, Philip James. And he's pictured here at our cottage up in Canada, where we spent summers. I loved it. It was a test of aging because as my female cousins and I matured, um, they discovered boys. I still wanted to fish. They stopped coming. They stayed in Buffalo. I kept going up to Canada with Grandpa and his little red rowboat and my drop line and sunfish and perch and bass and oh, how this man could fry fish. I can still taste it today. I can smell it. It was the most organoleptic experience. Every part of you tingled just knowing this fish was coming for dinner tonight. And we would sit in the little red rowboat and we would talk about life and sometimes talk about nothing at all. The little white scraggly dog pictured here is Mr. Magoo. Mr. Magoo was Grandpa's um, soulmate, bodyguard, 
Cute as a button, but take your hand off. The meanest dog ever born. So do not judge a picture, the book by it, its cover, because this animal was fierce, but he loved my grandfather, as did I. My grandfather introduced me to a book I remember my mother had a hissy fit about. I was too young, it was inappropriate. Dad, I don't think you should be reading this to her. And it was about this man, very special man. John Griffin wrote a book called Black Like Me. In the late 50s, he went into the Deep South, the prejudicial Deep South and through medical science, colored his white skin black. Fast forward, he died from cancer as a result of this experiment. And he wrote from the experience of being a black man who was actually a white man. There's only one universal we, one human family, united by the capacity to feel compassion and to demand equal justice for all. I recently had the great honor of being invited to Alabama by the Arts Alliance to deliver the 50th anniversary memorial speech for Martin Luther King. I was brought to a building that would open on April 26th. And I apologize for not using the proper name of the museum, which actually fails me, because everyone in Montgomery was referring to it as the lynching museum. And if you've been moved by the Holocaust museums around the world, if you've been to the footprint of the World Trade Towers, I can only explain that the lynching museum is that much more passion, compassion, empathy, and pain. It's hard for me to bite back tears and even describe it to you now. One of the most moving pieces is a wall of mason jars full of soil that was taken from the base of all the known lynching trees in the United States from the 1800s till very recently, sadly. A powerful reminder of the lunacy of hate and disparity, and certainly that time has come for all of this nonsense to stop. When John wrote Black Like Me, it was a, a diary of his experiences. And even he admitted words failed to express the pain of racial prejudice. He did his best. I was so moved by his story that I'm sure it was filed away in my little girl's brain for one day in the future. And it came when I met this man, Raymond Lowy, who's considered to be the father of American industrial product design. He wrote that good design keeps the user happy, the manufacturer in the black, and the aesthetic unoffended. In his book, Never Leave Well Enough Alone. I thought it was interesting to be the only broad in a class of male students. When I went to New York City to be in his office, I was one of 350, 350 boys and me. And you would think, ladies, that was a happy time. <laughs> Not. I was called every disparaging name for the female and body parts that you can imagine, to my face and behind my back. My work was sabotaged. I was treated most unfairly, most cruelly. But Mr. Lowy said to me, Patty, I hired you because I wanted your brain, but more so I wanted your heart. And I know you're Irish. Go get him. Mr. Lowy um, is someone I think you'll enjoy reading about if you haven't yet had that pleasure. He gave us uh, the first space station, Skylab, and the Coca-Cola bottle, and he gave us the first Air Force One for JFK, and just any product and service you can imagine 
did all sorts of logo types. He was the streamliner who gave us the great locomotives. And his favorite car design, the Avanti. So I was the only broad with a bunch of boys who were, let's just say, confused about why it was that Noah could possibly be wrong. Clearly, there should be two of everything on the ark. And I was there, not to prove it, but to show it. By the way, the way I got a around the hatred was with cookies. I mean, really, guys, you're very easy. I went to what was laughably referred to as HR back then, one little lady from Long Island who kept paper folders with everyone's birth date and social security number and the stuff you needed in order to get a paycheck in those days. And I made a list of all the gentlemen's birth dates in my division. And on their birthday, I came with a cake. It's really hard for a man to hate a woman bringing him a cake. The other guys are saying, don't you touch that cake. <laughs> Don't you say she, she made you a nice cake. But ping, 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 one by one, they ate the cake. They got religion. We all became friends. Life is good. Can I get a hallelujah? What are we all worried about? It's some of the happiest memories of my life and no longer tainted by the nastiness of the prejudice I faced in the early days. It was a very special time because I was hired specifically for the Soviet detente agreement, where once again, it was a designer who said, maybe we can stop war by getting our foe to stop making munitions and start making consumer goods. Imagine that. It failed. As you know, we have Putin today, but we tried. And you can still go to Moscow and go to the Stroganov Museum and see all the drawings and all the models. We tried very hard. But design wasn't yet enough. I'm going to offer before I'm finished today that maybe it's time is now. What I heard day in and day out when I was working in Mr. Lowy's group of 350 was that we don't design for those people. Those people? Those people were the people in a meeting where I'd raise my hand and say, well, what about someone with arthritis? What about someone who can't see? What about someone who doesn't put one foot in front of the other? What about someone who's not hearing as well as they maybe did? What about someone injured in war or an industrial accident or as I was being hit by a car? What about them? And I would hear. We don't design for those people. The most important design firm in the world, and they claimed they did not design for those people. I was intrigued. I decided to become one of those people. As things will happen in all of our lives, the Kowinky Dinky, the Kismet, the Serendipity, I went to an obligatory New York City party where you have to go where people look really angry on Monday morning at work. And I was just nearly to the door having made my appearance and wanting desperately to go home when I heard someone say hello and being a nice little Irish girl from Buffalo, I had to say hello back. And I'm so glad I did because that woman was Barbara Kelly and she was the makeup designer at Saturday Night Live. And we got to talking, and when I realized what she did, somehow I said, can you make me look 85? And she said, sure, because she's from Brooklyn. And so I became 85. And I traveled for nearly four years through this great land of ours, all of North America, into Canada as well. 116 cities in the guise of women whose only sin was they had been changed by the course of time a body unfamiliar with each waking day, a body doing things that would scare snakes, a body that when I wake up each day now, I think, what? <laughs> but then I remember my grandmother as she applied my lipstick and she would say to us at a very tender age, an ever-changing work of art. Amen to that. 
As a woman of 85, I had friends. I had to say goodbye to friends. I went to so many wakes and funerals. I wiped so many tears. I was treated well in shops and by people on the street with kindness and courtesy, and I was treated abhorrently. I was called all sorts of, all sorts of vulgarity. I was shortchanged by shopkeepers who saw that my lenses were clouded. They didn't realize they weren't true cataracts, but they were contacts that had lessened my natural ability and allowed me to see into the future, if you will. Every piece of my body was prosthetically changed. I wasn't an actress in costume. I was forced to live in this shell that all of us grow into over the course of time. Some of us to greater extremes than others. Some of us will lose capacities others will retain. And then sometimes, through the anomaly of birth or injury or the insult of war, there are those of us who live each day with a challenge of capacity. But in character, I was able to experience it firsthand. And the empathy I felt for others by design certainly became something about my own human condition. And I was able to evaluate how others were treating me or mistreating me like the day when a group of small boys, really no more than 10 or 12 years of age, chose to beat me and leave me in a pool of my blood on a city street. I remember the voice of the taxi driver who gently scooped me from the pavement and assured me I would be okay and got me to the hospital. But I also remember as they were beating me and through the pain I was thinking, I'll never have a baby. It's interesting what happens to us at a point of trauma like that. I remember that moment so clearly, and I was fighting to bend my legs into my chest, but I was wearing splints on my knees that approximated the inability to move about with ease, and I couldn't break the wood. And so I wasn't able to protect my core. It wasn't until I married years later that I started miscarrying and the doctors scratched their collective heads and couldn't figure out what was going wrong and then we realized, ah, and my pelvis had been so terribly damaged that there was nothing to be done back then. So the miracles of being able to have babies today didn't afford themselves to me at that time. It's also why today I warn students, even though I don't have children of my own, I am the mother you didn't know you had and I take my job very seriously, so don't irritate me. I found love as a woman of 85. I had more dates, actually, as a woman of 85 than I did as a woman of 26, and we'll go into that later because I need a 12-step program still to this day on that one. I met so many people who just were hungry for someone to give them a smile, a touch of the hand, just a moment of time to say, how are you today? Would you like to sit down? It's so easy to do. This is not rocket science. And so this wondrous experience, my own black like me, defined the rest of my career and who I am today. It was the birth of the universal design methodology, one which asks for global equity for all. It was one that recognized all over this blue, beautiful marble of a planet, people have needs, people have dreams, people have desires, and all of those can be met by design. That accessibility as the first step in all things is about getting past the barriers. When we look at the built environment and we see people struggling about our city streets, wondering how they even manage to safely get from one point to another, and I can certainly attest to that today, it's horrific to imagine what we put some people through. 
But then there's also the beauty of the challenge of mobility and accessibility, as I found in the ancient capital of Japan, in Nara, when one day in visiting a temple in the early morning hours, I saw a car stop at the base of these hundred stone steps. And a young woman about my age came around and opened the door and helped another woman, I guessed her mother, out of the car. And the older woman began the ascent. She put her umbrella tip on a step, and then a foot, and then the next foot, and then the umbrella tip, and a foot, and the next foot, and the umbrella. And then I heard the woman say to me, she's killing me. And I was delighted, because that sounded very buffalo. And I said, excuse me? My mother, she's killing me. <laughs> and this wonderful woman that I am now meeting in the ancient capital of Japan, who I had no idea spoke English, is telling me what a lot of daughters will tell you. Our mothers are killing us by what they do. I still smile through my tears at missing my mommy who so recently got her wings on all the times I heard myself saying to my mother, you're killing me. But oh, how I loved it, how I loved the challenge of getting through a day, meeting the needs of my mother just as my new friend in Japan was doing. She honored her mother by driving her to temple so her mother could offer her prayer and she allowed her mother to climb these hundred stone steps with this glorious dance of the umbrella tip and a foot and a foot, even though there was a ramp. <laughs> and this was why this sweet woman was saying, she's killing me, she won't use the ramp. And there's my little lesson. Sometimes we don't want the compensation. Sometimes we don't need the accommodation. Sometimes we just really want the appropriation of the stone steps. So let's be careful not to over-design solutions. Let's stop designing for people and design with people to make sure we're really giving them what they need. And that is, how the universal methodology has grown into an inclusivity. An inclusivity that speaks to the design imperatives that each of us will have in our life. If we don't hold hands and work together, there won't be much hope for a good life. As we look at the complexity of technology, the opportunity of the design imperative that we have today and what we will have tomorrow, we have to remind ourselves, mind, body, heart, and soul. Language is very important to me. I never use this word handicapped unless I'm talking about horses. And by the way, I told the gentleman I flew next to coming here that I thought Goodwitch was going to win because it was wearing yellow silks, and it almost did. <laughs> so I should have placed a bet. I didn't. I don't use the word handicap for people because we all have a level of ability, and handicap has a sound to me that I'm not keen on. Let me see if I can describe it better. I would never say to a child such as this little boy with a prosthetic leg, oh, poor baby, you're handicapped. If anything, I would say, what a great ball player you are, just as the wounded warrior with his prosthetic leg has been teaching this child. Not to worry about what he doesn't have, what's wrong with him, what's not normal, but rather the great gifts he does have, and then he's being taught to apply them. That's our goal. Giving people a capacity of self-care to be able to attain a level of autonomy and independence that they own and is theirs, whatever they want it to be, and not to challenge or question that by design. The hardest work I've done in my career to date is working with the wounded warriors. And in the image I'm showing of this brave Marine, you can see a body ravaged by the vulgarity of war and violence. 
but you can also see on his bed two pieces of technology his father and his grandfather before him did not have in a time of recuperation from war. The technology of the mobile phone, the technology of the laptop, the reader, the desktop, have redefined what we can do by design for any of us with need. Because the focus is ability, not what's wrong, but what's right. And that's a matter of design. And while I was born to the Jim Kelly era, you know, Jim Kelly, God bless him, keep him in your prayers, he's recovering from another cancer, gives one of the best motivational speeches I think I've ever witnessed, and that's when he takes the stage and he tells the audience, yes, the Buffalo Bills have a record that no one will ever break. They went to the Super Bowl four years in a row and lost every time. <laughs> And the crowd goes wild, and people are so proud. And I am proud of that, because I'm proud of anyone who can laugh through their tears and embrace the fact that, so we didn't win. We got to go to the show. So I'm telling you all right here and now, and Jim Kelly just had a tremble, because he's hearing me say, I hope the Seahawks take it this year, because I think hiring the Griffin twins is one of the most appealing sports stories I've witnessed in my life. To know that we have a young man who has one hand playing pro football is just for me a moment of such joy. And I think everybody better look out for the Seahawks. <laughs> it's about life's quality that we speak. It's about recognizing we provide choices for people because it's only with choice in your life that you have control. And so, yes, I'm a bit of a dominatrix sometimes where I bring executives through their paces by modifying their bodies with prosthetics, not in a hidden way like my costuming did when I was an elder, but to give them a sense of what it might be like to shop in their store or to deal with their product if, in fact, their body is encumbered by incapacity. And it is usually a very successful tool of conversion. You've heard of all the age suits and things of this nature. They can be quite effective to get us to think in someone else's perspective. But as I go around the world and I see remote controls such as these modified, um, we have one straight from the factory and one that a loving child or friend or neighbor has wrapped with duct tape to just expose the really essential buttons, and yet that, I'm sure, still gives people fits. I'm reminded of when, at the age of 85, I was visiting my parents and um, my daddy bought a, a new slew of televisions. I never had to buy any entertainment electronics when that man was alive because he was an early adopter and he bought new stuff every year or whenever anything came out. And I'd get these strange cardboard boxes that he had wrapped so they would survive the blast. And, and it would be, you know, VCR, tape deck, whatever it was, I got his cast-offs. But I remember Daddy with tears in his eyes, an electrician with tears in his eyes, handing me the remote control of the new television and admitting he couldn't turn on the TV. And I asked, what are you doing, Daddy? And he was pressing the TV button. Kind of makes sense. And I had to tell him, stop pressing the TV button, Daddy. This is a computer now and walked him through it and used nail polish to highlight what buttons he should use and still got phone calls. What was it again? How do I turn this on? But he was demoralized, he was mortified, he was saddened that he couldn't even turn on a TV. The pendulum has flung, slung too far for some of us. And so we have to be mindful of this designing with, not designing for. Even all the attempts at universal remotes further befuddle and muddy the waters. And so we're not yet there. Of course, you know, the answer is voice control, but what if you don't have a voice? And on and on. So the challenge continues. 
But the point remains, let's not forget everybody as we design. Your first art gallery was the family refrigerator, as you might recall, and maybe it still is. I don't judge. If you're coming home and showing your spouse, look what I did today, and it's going up with a magnet of Niagara Falls, I think that's probably a good thing. But what we're doing to refrigerators today is starting to make me feel a little uncomfortable. Again, my father, as an electrician, was one of those people who got buku bucks to fix stuff that broke. And when I see these kinds of moving parts going into refrigerators that are now the brain central of a household, it makes me wonder if maybe we haven't misstepped yet again. Um, bad enough when the ice maker or the water dispenser is broken, but now that the refrigerator is becoming a computer for the whole household calendar, it's possibly something we should be reevaluating as well. Because Usability is really the mandate of our time. How do we provide for personal provision? How do we speak all languages universally? How do we address all cultures? How do we recognize that this little one was born to this stuff and I'm a living tutorial? And every time we test new technology with older consumers or any consumer to whom this technology is new, we see evidence of our failure. By the way, the quick one in this kind of imagery, if you're able to see a consumer using an interface and you see the neck go back, they can't see it. A little rocket science for y'all. If we have low contrast, if we have too much nomenclature and text and not enough iconographic cueing, we have failed design. And why can't we just have what they promised me on Star Trek? Little magic windows opening and I get a chocolate milkshake. Why can't I have that? Why isn't there a means to beam me up, Scotty? Why was I in traffic three hours yesterday trying to get from Indianapolis to Bloomington? Why, I ask you people. <laughs> Why indeed? Because things change. We change. But we're still those beautiful snowflakes, no two of us alike. And in our uniqueness, we deserve capacity as we change. And so if one day you're going to have a hand that doesn't function as it once does, or you lose that hand, or you never had a hand, Let's be sure that as designers, we're not giving you options you can't control. And let's recognize that vision is a gift for some, levels of vision a gift for some. Recently, I was diagnosed with Drusen, and I must have been absent that day in medical school. I didn't recognize the term. It's most probably the precursor to macular degeneration. Well, I'll admit my heart skipped a beat because selfishly I thought, oh darn, I wanted to be an artist at the end of my career. But maybe I'm not meant to be a painter as I once dreamed. Maybe there's something else waiting for me at the end of my rainbow. And the only reason I have calm and a certain level of being Pollyanna in spirit is because I have faith by design. Cognitively, I'm amazed at what we do to each other. Um, I was struck by a car in Wellington, New Zealand. This is a picture from Christchurch, New Zealand. It's actually, interestingly, at a church. This is a sign I, I took a picture of in a church parking lot. And it's a sign that clearly um, someone said, change the direction of the entry into the parking lot. Or maybe it's the exit, I'm not clear. So instead of painting out the old sign with the background color of blue, I believe it was painted out with black. And the new sign, uh, the new arrow for direction, is a red arrow with an, a white outline. I'm pretty sure that's the intention. Oh, but how I wished I was there on Sunday morning for services, just so I could see the bumper cars. <laughs> 
and the language I'm imagining, everyone forgetting what they just praised in church as they tried to get their car out of a parking lot. Cognitive design is a very interesting field, and this interface is one that I still see things that would scare fish. I want to uh, leave you today with a couple of um, points that I've learned over the years, and that is, even as a gerontologist, I can tell you, age is a meaningless variable. Uh, it is not a prediction of capacity. I know we all thrill in learning that yet another couple of brothers somewhere in these great United States of ours stole daddy's truck earlier today and sent the state troopers on a wild ride as one worked the pedals and one was steering and as the truck was finally pulled over to the side of the road and the boys weren't harmed, we find that this team tandem driver was four years of age. Ford did not design that truck for these boys, but oh, what fun it is to borrow the keys and take it on a joy ride. I can't drive anymore. And I think that's a good thing, because God intended me to have staff. <laughs> <laughs> I often tease students, what do I drive? I ask these lovely engineering majors. And you get everything from Prius to Lamborghini and yada, yada, yada. And then finally I say, I don't have a car. Why would I have a car? I have a driver. <laughs> and then they're like, ooh, <laughs> I want to be like Patty. I want a driver. I highly recommend it. Bless you. Now, if you're laughing at this sign, you're going to have to talk to me backstage. I deliberately show ageist humor because it's ageist humor. And sadly, we all of us find ourselves giggling still to this day when we see this. And it's a tough one to talk about in just a few moments, but let's just say laughing at anyone is wrong. Laughing with someone can be appropriate, but be very careful if you find yourself giggling at someone because of what they can't do. It's probably not the right thing to do. So 65 became the age of retirement because Bismarck thought, well, I'll make my people happy and I'll tell them when you reach 65, you're going to get money from the government. It's going to be fabulous. You won't have to worry about a thing. Well, it wasn't being magnanimous that made this leader think of this pension plan. It was because no one lived to be 65 primarily. So it was a false offering. And to this day, it's still a bit of a false offering as we watch pension funds dry up and shrivel. But we are looking worldwide now at a new retirement age of 72. And that, too, is, is going away in certain industries. I, I certainly hope I work within one, because I hate to think I'm told someday by contract that I have to quit at this age. Mr. Wang is 82, and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so Brian just gave me the high fight to wind it up, so let me do it with this. Aging in place is a new mantra. It's not very sexy. We have to come up with better nomenclature than this. But it's all about the autonomy and independence we desire and deserve by design. Instead of helicopter parents, we now have helicopter children looking after their parents and driving them crazy. And so we have to be very careful about what we do on behalf of our parents and our grandparents and our elders whom we love and recognize they should be in control. And I love the idea of this emerging construct that we are living together and sharing the chores of everyday life because that is the social order that is most appealing. I found after my accident that I live in a very stupid house. It did next to nothing for me. And I'm not sure I want Alexa waking me in the night giggling maniacally. <laughs> and if any of you had that experience, I'm, I'm sorry. What I want are tools for everyday living. 
I want to be able to take my medication without confusion. If you want to get rich, those younger fledgling designers in the room, please fix medication management. This is a tough nut to crack. Technology, I'll argue, has to be soft and hard. It has to be high and low. And yes, I'm chipped because I work for our government and I work all over the world. And for some reason, some people seem to want to find me if I go lost. But I want us to remember, through all of our discussions today and beyond, it's the humanism in what we do that is most essential. I grew up thinking I was going to have Rosie the robot. I was the daughter of the Jetsons. And every year I go to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and I'm horrified by these Michelin men robots that are <laughs> dropping models on the showroom floor. I know precisely what I want. I want Johnny Depp as Captain Jack for my AI, my caregiver, my roomie. <laughs> and I know we are going to have a hell of a time. <laughs> I'm showing a picture of me dressed as a pirate, and I think it's a look. It's holistic, after all, what we're doing. It's health, it's lifestyle. It's fellow road warriors like this gentleman I saw in O'Hare at 87 years of age with his gin and tonic as God intended, with his emailing, his texting, his swearing, which was hilarious. Because what we're doing today is changing the medical models, the really horrific, durable medical design that's being imposed upon most of us throughout the course of our lives, and creating more of a consumer model. Not that Toto has all of the answers, but if it's allowing choice, control, independence, and autonomy, we're getting close. Design, after all, has responsibilities. If there's a child anywhere in the world today desperately trying to learn without the appropriate tools. They need design. Design has opportunities to serve. IKEA's brilliant new solution for temporary housing in refugee camps, so much better than pitched tents. Mr. Lowy always predicted I would do trains. I thought him mad. I'm doing trains. <laughs> but the only reason I'm doing trains is because I was allowed one caveat to design trains for the people who needed them the most. People who weren't the normal. People we used to call handicapped and now who I hope we just call people. And yes, I take great pride in the work I get to do in aircraft design. And God bless Captain Tammy. Because when you can bring in an aircraft, as she did so miraculously, it's a good day. And I'm glad to hear that what we did in the flight deck control design helped enormously. We all of us have expe expectations, my friends, for a good life every child everywhere in the world expect, expects access ability for an entire lifespan use ability for the caregiving the caretaking by design every culture Every country deserving of the design lifespan challenge. Not walls, not barriers, bridges. In one of his last interviews, Professor Hawking was asked, what do we need to survive? And he answered, empathy. God bless him.
God bless us all.